Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome all today. Uh, I'm Juliana Jardim. I'm a PhD student at North Carolina State University, and I'll be chairing this last session of the second international virtual seminar of wood pulp and biorefinery. Our next speaker is Dr. Daniela Moraes de Carvalho. She has a doctorate degree in forest science and currently works as a postdoc in the group of food material science at the University of Helsinki uh, in Finland. She has promoting the use of lignocellulosic polymers uh, for several sustainable applications. Please join her uh, lecture on hemicellulosis, uh, structure properties and functionalities, and discover en the enormous potential of hemicellulose. If you have any questions, uh, remember to send through our chat and remember to start it with hashtag question. Dr. Carvalho, I will hand it to you now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I was having some problem here. I just want to confirm it to you because I was hearing uh, some delay with Juliana, like she was speaking and then I was hearing the same after some time. It was just for me or you also were having this situation? Well, I, I was just hearing myself. Um, can, can you share your, uh, your screen, I, I guess? I'm still having, I can hear what I was saying before now. I mean, it's, well. Uh, I mean. Hi everyone. Well, uh, I apologize for these uh, pro problems in the beginning of the presentation. Actually, I was hearing some strange um, 
return of the of Julian introduction. And at least for me, I was introduced twice by Julian. I was hearing it, it like in a double uh, sound. So yeah, uh, I would like to to uh, thank you, Julian, for the nice presentation. And oh, Yara, please <laughs> again, uh, maybe.
Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you for your patience to wait for, our, for, for, uh, for us to solve this um, technological issue. Now it's time to start. Uh, I would like also to thank you, Juliana, for the kind introduction. And also uh, say that it's a pleasure to me return to my former university and have this moment here with you. I hope that uh, this presentation, it is insight about hemicellulosis can be interesting for some of you. Uh, just for those that uh, don't know me, this is a short introduction about myself. I have a first engineering degree from the Federal University of Vissosa and also a master and a doctorate degree in the same university. Uh, I also have a licentiate in, uh, of engineering in fiber and polymer science from the Royal Test Institute of Technology in Sweden. And during a quite long time now, I have research about biopolymers from lignocellulosic biomasses. And part of this research is what I'm going to share with you today. Well, uh, at this moment, I'm located in Finland. Finland is this uh, country in the north of Europe. And we here are about 5 million people, from which one third, one, one fifth of this total is concentrated in the Helsinki metropolitan area. Uh, Helsinki is the city where I'm living at this moment. Uh, and uh, just to you know a bit about uh, what this city can offer, the city has some historical and uh, modern and also modern uh, arch architecture, but also um, at the same time that the, the city has this urban area, there is also the natural area. Here you can see some pictures from the, that is in the Helsinki University. And uh, uh, based on these uh, pictures, it's also possible to, to see how the Finnish people are concerned about natural resources, about the life in contact with the nature, and about this uh, combination or this well combination of uh, life in ur urban areas at the same time as life in contact with the nature. Uh, I am at the University of Helsinki, and this university exists since 1640. The university has 11 faculties and uh, the different faculties are divided in four campuses. The campus where I'm located is the Viki campus, as you can see here in this picture. And beside the, the, the various campus, the university also contains various research stations dedicated to provide to the students and researchers the possibility to conduct experiments and also to have lectures in a local uh, area. There are more than 31,000 students at this moment and more than 8,000 employees. Uh, at the university, I'm located in the Faculty of Agriculture and Forest. And more specifically, I'm in the Department of Food and Nutrition. I'm um, working at this moment in the Food Material Science Research Group. Then uh, you might be asking or questioning how someone that has some formation in wood, now it's working in a department of food. Well, uh, if you just look at the words, the words are not that different each other. However, uh, the, context, the, co the concepts behind the wood and the food are quite different. And at least for me, this connection was made by the hemicellulosis. Well, uh, this is a long story until this connection uh, occurred, but I always start from the beginning. And the beginning is, what is hemicellulosis? Hemicellulosis are a component of lignocellulosic biomasses that can vary between different biomasses from 20 to 50%, and is basically a polysaccharide. Actually, it's an heteropolysaccharide because uh, 
unlike two cellulose, for example, that's composed from one only monosaccharide, in the hemicellulose, it's possible to have different monosaccharides linked to each other to form the, the, molecular, the molecule. Also, the hemicellulose is branched, which means that there are some side groups in the main structure. It is possible to have some natural acetylation in the hemicellulose, and the degree of polymerization can vary between uh, hemicellulose, but a number about 200, 200 it's something reasonable. But more important than, than all these concepts behind, it's important to know that the hemicellulose can be different. And this means that the hemicellulose can vary between species of um, plants, between the uh, can vary depending on the age of these plants, depending on the tissue and other um, components. For example, it's possible to have variation in hemicellulose depending on the treatment that is applied for their extraction for the biomass, for example. Uh, here I have some structures, very simple, just to have some idea of how this variation can occur in different um, biomasses. Here I have the representation of hardwood, softwood, and grasses. And you can see that the main hemicellulose in each of these, of these biomasses can vary. Uh, we can see that the xylem is the main component in the case of hardwood and grasses. But in the case of softwood, it is the manan, the main component. But, um, and, and also it's important to know that even if there is one hemicellulose that's the most common in each of these biomasses, other hemicellulose can still be present in the composition of, the, of such biomasses. Uh, if you just take as example the xylem, we can see that the structure of the xylem also varies between the different um, biomasses. Here you can see that the, the composition of the mono, monosaccharide vary between the different uh, hemicellulose and also the acetylation position and the acetylation degree can vary. And in the case of the softwood, the xylem in softwood, no acetylation is observed. Uh, uh, anatomically, the hemicellulose is responsible for the structural support of the cell wall. And uh, if we take a look of this representation here in the side, we can see that the hemicellulose occupy a very strategic position in the cell wall as well, because the hemicellulose occupy an interface between the cellulose and the lignin. And it's for this very reason that the hemicellulose act, uh, is more sus susceptible to be attacked during treatments. And then it's the hemicellulose, the main component that is eventually or intentionally degraded when chemical or thermal treatment is subjected to the biomass for the biomass deconstruction. De if uh, just to return in, in the past in some of my works, what I could see is that sometimes it's impossible to, to avoid the extraction of hemicellulose by cer certain type of um, treatments. For example, when we are producing pulp, cellulose pulp, the hemicellulose is one of the components main degraded during the, the process. And sometimes it's possible as well to optimize the conditions in order to both or to either or uh, retain the hemicellulose in the case that the end product can have properties improved by the, the presence of hemicellulose or you can also remove the hemicellulose when the presence can of the hemicellulose in the end product is not beneficial for the properties. But there are circumstances where the presence of the hemicellulose is not interesting. 
For example, when we are using the biomass for the production of bioethanol, and the yeasts used are not able to fer to utilize the hemicellulose sugars for the production of ethanol. In this case, what is usually done is that some pretreatments are performed just for the for promote the maximum extraction of the hemicellulose as possible. And then uh, when it was in 2012, I started my doctoral studies and the main focus of the, these studies was the production of bioethanol. And what I could realize using the pretreatments that I was doing was that many, the main focus of some of these pretreatments was the removal of the hemicellulose. But then uh, I just realized that the circular bioeconomy was not being applied in my study because I was removing something that potentially has some value. Then I got this possibility to, to include hemicellulose also in my studies. And during this time, I have this doctoral exchange, which also gave me the possibility to get the licensiate degree in, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. And in this um, opportunity, what I did was a fundamental study of hemicellulose structure aiming their valorization. So uh, at that moment, I was using sugarcane as the main biomass in the study. And I was using uh, both residues from the sugarcane plant, which is the bagasse, that is the stalk of the plant, and the straw, which is the leaves and the, also the tips of the stalk. And the reason to use those uh, wastes was that they are quite abundant. They are generating some excess, and um, this excess was not being utilized by the sugarcane industry. And um, the valorization of it can also promote some more technological use of the biomass and also promote some uh, other industrial collaborations. And uh, in this study, I was focusing on the hem uh, on the silent because uh, as some literature has reported, the silent is the main hemicellulose in grass. But then um, when you starting to study the xylem, some things are something are very important to be considering. The first is that what one is interesting to know about the structure of, of some hemicelluloses. And uh, I, can, I can say you that what we are interested in when we studied some structure of hemicellulose, in this case the xylem, is which functional groups or which sugars are present in the structure. Uh, also, we are interested in how many of these sugars or functional groups are present in one molecule, where these sugars or functional groups are linked to the main, main backbone, and how this uh, linkage is established. More than that, it's also, it's also interesting to know other attributes of the structure, for example, the molecular, molecular size of the, these molecules. And for this, some advanced analytical techniques are crucial because they can give to us information that just classical uh, techniques maybe cannot be so specific and give us. Uh, other, inter other important things to be considered are the methodology used for the extraction of the material. And uh, in this case, what I was applying was removing extractives first from the biomass. And then after to remove the, is, these extractives, I was applying two types different of different delignification methods, one of them 
using the paracetic acid in the other, the sodium chloride. And then I was solubilizing the xylem in a solvent. In this case, I was using the methyl sulfoxide. And then using this protocol, I could at the end get the xylem with the acetyl groups preserved. But uh, there are also some limitations of the methods or something that we need to think about or take into consideration when analyzing the results that we can get. And one of them, uh, or maybe two of them that we can, we need to consider in, in combination is they are the selectivity and the integrity. This is because when we apply some mild method for the extraction of the hemicellulose, they can be so mild that at the end, some other components can be co-extracted together. But if we apply a very harsh condition, what we can have at the end is the degradation of the native structure. So uh, it's important to create a balance of selectivity and integrity, or their uh, balance of the severity of the conditions in order to, at the end, have the material in the condi have the sample in the condition that we want. And then in this case here, we really uh, compare the selectivity, how much we were extracting only, only xylem from the biomasses, but at the same time, we are, were interested to check if the xylem that we were obtained were still having um, the preservation of the attributes that should have in the native form. And also other interesting or other points to be considered is the efficiency of the process. Because uh, when using this dimethyl sulfoxide for the solubilization of the xylem, the yield of xylem by the end is very low. For fundamental analysis, like for the characterization or elucidation of the structure, this is fine or at least reasonable. But if we uh, consider the application in industry, for example, this yield is very low, so it's not applicable. Uh, at this moment, we decide to use this condition because then we could have the sample for the analysis. But I will discuss uh, later in this presentation what can be done when we want to improve also the, the yield of the material prepared. And uh, yeah, as I told you, two types of uh, delignification were applied. One using the parasitic acid and other using the sodium chloride. And what you could get from the result was that the purity, uh, the preservation of the structural uh, attributes, and also the yield of the method of using the parasitic acid were, were quite uh, were better than that using the sodium chloride. So in this study, we decide to to continue only with the samples prepared using the parasitic acid, followed by the solubilization of the cellulose or the xylem by the methyl sulfoxide for the fundamental analysis of their structure. And uh, what we could get from results in this study was that it was possible to isolate acetylated glucuronyl xylem from the sugarcane uh, waste. And, uh, but the structure of the xylem from bagasse and straw, they were quite different or they have some variation between um, these different tissues in terms of pattern and frequency of substitution, in terms of acetylation frequency and also the molar mass. Uh, here I have the illustration of uh, the structure that we could uh, elucidate using this study. Uh, if this structure is too much information for you, please don't, don't be like scared about, just focus uh, on what is was were more important from this elucidation. And the more important is that Yes, uh, the different tissues have different structure of hemicellulose, probably related to the function of this hemicellulose in the different um, parts of the plant. The hemicellulose of the xylem from bagasse, they were more linear, 
then that from straw, which contains more branches. And that one from the bagasse also have more acetylation. And uh, the acetylation distribution were quite similar between the different uh, parts, the different uh, materials. Of course, uh, they were quite similar in terms of the distribution, but not in the terms of the amount. And uh, the molar mass of the, the xylon in bagasse was quite high compared to that from the straw, although the the xylon from the straw was more diverse, which means that uh, there were more variability in the molar size for straw than that from the bagasse. And uh, what I can say about uh, this previous work that I just presented to you is that it's very important to know the structure of the xylon in native form when you think about their valorization, because we need to start from some point. And this point in this case is know how it is without any um, modification that can be performed, for example, during the extraction uh, when more harsh conditions are used. And after to, to have understood how the, the, is the molecular structure of the xylem in sugarcane bagasse and sugarcane straw, I got this opportunity for my first postdoc, which was in the Woodpoke Pulping Chemistry Research Network project, to continue the investigation of, of xylem. More specifically, what I was doing here was uh, study a bit more about the xylem of different materials. Sugarcane bagasse and sugarcane straw, I just have um, studied before. The eucalyptus was also included in the study when I was doing for the, the characterization for bagasse and straw. But since uh, there was some um, data from literature from other researchers, they were not included in the paper that um, we published. But yes, uh, we also analyzed the same eucalyptus um, biomass that we used in the continuation of the study. But uh, what we did was also include some um, Nordic resources, which was the birch and the spruce, in order to cover a, a wider range of biomasses in this study. Just one thing here that is important to mention is that Sugarcane bagasse, sugarcane straw, eucalyptus, and birch, all of them are rich sources of xylem. In the case of the spruce, the main hemicellulose present is not the xylem, it's the manum. But we still uh, include this just to have some idea of the potential of uh, soft wood in this type of study. And uh, since the structure was already elucidated by us or by other uh, resources before us for those uh, biomasses. What we start to do in this project was the uh, inefficient preparation of the, the xylem samples. As I told you, the, the methyl sulfoxide is not good in terms of to generate high amount of, of xylem. Then we start to use a different strategy and this strategy was to using an alkaline condition instead. The alkaline condition can give very high um, yield, but what uh, happened during the treatment is some chemical modification of the structure of the xylem. In this case, it's the removal of the acetyl groups. And the preservation of acetyl groups can confer some properties to the xylem. So what could be here a limitation we took as an opportunity to control the dysfunctionalization. And what we did was to perform uh, acetylation of the hemicellulose or the xylem that we just got without the acetyl groups. And the, the good thing of this control function, functionalization is that we can uh, get different degrees of acetylation as we want, and also degrees of acetylation 
even higher than that that naturally can occur in the in in vegetal in the plant. Uh, the first uh, analysis that we did for the biomasses was the chemical characterization, and here we just confirmed that the main component in the samples were the xylem. Of course, we still have some some other components, probably from pectins and other hemicelluloses, but the main component was the xylem. And in this study also we include a commercial xylem just to have some reference. And of course, the commercial xylem was much more purified than the xylem that we could get using the alkaline condition. Uh, in terms of purity, we could see that uh, um, the purity of the sample was quite, uh, in terms of, this was uh, more about the yield actually, and then the yield was quite reasonable, except for the spruce, but the spruce, uh, since the manon is the main hemicellulosis present, uh, the manon was also co-extracted with the xylem. Then we spent several steps of purification in order to get a purity, um, that the purity that we want, but these also uh, compromise the yield because in every step of purification, part of the of the xylem was removed from the biomass that we were preparing. But uh, in terms of purity, the purity were quite high, and uh, we could identify the presence of glucuron xylem in birch and eucalyptus, of arabino glucuron xylem in spruce and of glucurono arabino xylem in sugarcane bagasse and straw. During the acetylation, what we want is substitute the, the hydroxyl group by one uh, acetyl group. And we monitor this acetylation using the FTIR. And you could get uh, different degrees of acetylation from low to high proving that we can control the acetylation. And also one uh, result that we got from here was that when the xylem was more purified, the reactivity during the acetylation was high. And the acetylation, of course, changed some um, properties of the xylem, uh, changed and increased the molar, molar mass, the hydrodynamic volume, in the, the dispersed index, and also change the dispersion ability of the xylem in different solvents. By the acetylation, the xylem became less uh, prone to be dispersed in water, for example. But probably the main result of this acetylation was in terms of thermal stability. Here, uh, I just have the representation of, or the results for the birch just to have some illustration, but all the different uh, biomasses source uh, uh, present a similar result, which was that after the acetylation, the capacity to absorb water decreased and the degradation by temperature was more efficient. But what really surprised us for, was the increasing of the thermal stability which means that the temperature in which the degradation of the xylem is started increased from 70 to 145 degrees for the all biomasses, and also the temperature in which the maximum degradation of the hemicellulose occur increased uh, more than 66 degrees. Also, there was some um, benefit effect on the glass transition by the acetylation. Here we have only the xylem non-acetylated and the xylem acetylated at high degrees. And as a conclusion of this um, an, uh, a study on the acetylation of the xylem, we could check and that the chemical modification by acetylation really enhances the thermal stability of xylem. And then, um, in the continuation, what we want to do was test some application for the xylem that we prepared. And in this application, we use the film formation. For the film formation, we used the 
xylem from birch. And we use both the commercial xylem and the xylem that we prepared using the alkaline um, treatment. We cast the fumes from the non-acetylated xylem in water. And according to literature, it's very difficult to form a continuous film without using some plasticizer. That's why we also apply three different plasticizers uh, for checking the possibility to form these fumes. We use the glycerol, sorbitol, and xylitol. And for the acetylated xylem, we cast the fumes using chloroform as the medium. And then later, we test the optical and physical mechanical properties. Um, yeah, the results that we can we, that we got is here in this figure. Just to explain you what we have here, we have uh, the A is the non-acetylated xylem fumes, and as I told you, we test without and with plasticizer. Uh, and since the result was quite similar in terms of visual aspect, here is just the, fig the picture of one of these. In this case, here was the non uh, it was the, the, the film formed without the use of any plasticizer, but the aspect of the others were quite similar. Then we have in B, the xylem prepared at low degree of acetylation casted in water, and C, the low acetylated casted in chloroform, and finally, the, in D, the fumes casted in chloroform using the high acetylated xylem. And what surprised us here was that contradicting the literature, we could prepare fumes using the our uh, alkaline prepared xylem without the use of any plasticizer. And the reason for this that we could get was that the presence of the other polysaccharides in the sample, um, maybe from other hemicelluloses or pectin, they act as a natural plasticizer in the formation of the film, and they really um, fill the voids uh, left from the xylem itself. In the case of the commercial xylem that was quite purified, the, this lack of other polysaccharides make that it was impossible to form films with uh, using the, the xylem, even if some plasticizer was applied. In terms of uh, color or in terms of, of transparency, what we could see is that the films using the xylem non-acetylated, we could see that they are quite transparent. And in the case of the xylem prepared from the, the samples acetylated, they were from translucent to opaque. Uh, although some variation dependent on the plasticizer was observed, the range in, of the transmittance was quite similar for the various conditions. Yeah, uh, in the case of the, the xylem, acetylated at low degree of acetylation, we didn't succeed in form uh, continuous fumes in using any of the solvents or either water or chloroform. Then we test also the physical, physical mechanical properties and you could see that the plastical, um, the plastical behavior only was observed when using highest uh, content of plasticizer. And in the case of the, the, that one using lower content of plasticizer, which was the 20%, the, the, the mechanical properties were developed in the same range as the acetylation. So yeah, we could uh, identify the beneficial, the, beneficial aspect of using xylem containing some other heteropolysaccharide in the formation of the film because they act as natural plasticizer. And also we could uh, observe that the acetylation improves the mechanical properties in a similar manner as the use of 20% of plasticizer for our xylem. 
And then uh, here is when really the food part start to merge with the wood um, functionality. After to finalize this postdoc, I got the possibility to start a new postdoc in the ROC project. The ROC project uh, stands for the role of lignin carbohydrate complex as key to stable emotions. This project is, uh, was funded by the Tandem Forest Valu, which uh, create the cooperation between uh, institutions and research centers in Sweden and in Finland. And in this uh, project, I got the possibility to, to came to Finland to develop or conduct part of the experiments here. And uh, the, the aim of this project was to valorize the Nordic forests. More specifically, we uh, tried to valorize components from birch and spruce. Uh, but, but just to understand the purpose of this project, uh, it's for application in emotion. And the uh, emotion are, by definition, industrial dispersions formed by immiscible liquids which have wide application in products as food, pharmaceutical, chemicals, etc. And uh, what we can understand from this concept is that when we just a mixture, oil and water, they, do, they will not spontaneously form a, a dispersion. In order to form this dispersion, some agent should cover the droplet, the oil droplet, in a way that create the, increase the tension surface of the, the oil droplet and then create these um, conditions for the dispersion to be formed and the agents should be used in, in this type of systems are called as emulsifiers. But what was discovered by the group in which I'm now, before I start this, this project, was that hemicellulosis are excellent emulsifier agents. They, uh, they can really cover this oil droplet in a such a way that create um, quite nice dispersion systems. And uh, what uh, or how they, they prepare the material or the hemicellulose in this case for, for the preparation of the, or for the utilization of the, the, of the as emulsifiers was using a hot water extraction. Uh, simply they use the spruce and birch wood they subject it in a hot water extraction, and then the water extract obtained that contained more than 70% of hemicellulose was tried and used as emulsifier. Uh, of course, if the, the extract contained more than 70% of hemicellulose, but around 7 to 75, 25 to 30% of these extracts are not hemicellulose. Actually, they are other polysaccharides or lignin compounds. And actually, and here also, the presence of these other components proved to be beneficial. When we just look for in this schematic uh, illustration here, we have the hypothesis created by the, my research group in the past for the stabilization of emotion using hemicellulosis. In this illustration, we can see that the hemicellulose contain this hydrophilic site. They, they can really interact well with the water phase. But the lignin that is more hydrophobic or more lipophilic, the, the lignin can interact with the oil phase. And then in this case, they have uh, components or compounds really interacting with both phases of the emotion. But the question here is, how about the interaction between the hemicellulose and the lignin? What is the nature of this interaction? And the hypothesis was that uh, the lignin and hemicellulose in this case are covalently linked by the so-called lignin carbohydrate complexes. 
in this case, uh, or in this hypothesis, the structure is, is, can explain well how uh, this single molecule can have two different um, polarity sites that can interact with different polarity uh, phases. But at this moment, when this hypothesis was raised, there was not chemical analysis or analytical proof of the existence of this uh, LCC in the sample in the study. And this was, uh, the, this was when I could start the, to collaborate with this project. But before to just introduce how uh, we study this, I would just to refresh in your mind what these LCC bonds are. Well, uh, all these fragments here in blue represent carbohydrates or hemicellulose or, or what you can, how can you um, be more comfortable to, to call these um, sugar parts. And then and the lignin here is represented in, in green. And when we talk about LCC bonds, we are talking about this very, um, the, this region where there is this linkage between the carbohydrate side and the lignin side. Uh, according to the literature, in, in water extracts from wood, we can have these three types of, of LCC bonds, the phenylglucoside, the benzyl ether, and the gamma ester. And that their identification can be obtained using NMR analysis. And what we did for our samples was to check if their presence in the samples were, could be identified. And more than that, sometimes the, even if present, the frequency of these LCC bonds can be very low. And this can compromise the analysis because uh, since the polysaccharides uh, and the ligamine can be present in much more frequency, maybe can be difficult to identify this single bond. So in our case, we try to apply some chemical and physical fractionation also in order to improve or to, in order to concentrate the LCC bonds and also improve the identification of such uh, linkages. Uh, in this study, we use the spruce and the birch structs. And since the main component in the spruce was the galactoglucomannan, uh, from here, I would just call it as GGM. And for the birch, the main component was the glucuronosylon. And then from here also, you just call it SGX for simplicity. Um, and here you can see in this disk, various types of fractionation that we performed for, for in order to, con to try to concentrate the LCC bonds and improve the identification. There are many um, information behind this figure that I encourage you to check our publication, but just so you have some idea what we have done, we have analyzed uh, the raw sample, uh, which was the, the sample after the extraction with hot water and dry. And then this first sample was dried by spray drying, which is here represented in this disc as the part in blue. And then after that, we also performed uh, antisolvent fractionation using ethanol. And we collect both fractions, that one that was precipitated in ethanol and that one that was solubilized in ethanol. Um, the precipitated is in green, and then the solubilized is in orange, and you collect them and also analyze to check if just this um, antisolvent fractionation can improve the identification of LCC. After that, we also applied some physical methods that were inert and mild. And uh, what we applied was the ultracentrifugation, and then we collect both the pellets and the supernatant. And uh, in the pellet and supernatant, both were subjected for ultracentrifugation later. 
And uh, the fraction that was retained by the nanofiltration membrane was called as large particles. And the fraction that was uh, poured by the nanofiltration membrane, we call it as small fractions. So just using this physical fractionation, we could obtain four different fractions for each of the samples. And in addition to this, we also applied some enzymatic treatment in order to remove some carbohydrate fractions that were not involved in LCC bonds. And uh, uh, yeah, and then at the end, we what we could obtain as a result from this is that uh, the presence of LCC bonds was identified. Actually, the, same, the GGM fraction or the GGM sample, that one that was obtained from the spruce, was functionalized by the presence of the, the LCCs. And then this also can explain well why this, um, this sample acts so good as a stabilizer because of all this uh, explanation I gave to you before that in the same molecule we have different polarities. And uh, we could also check that using physical fractionation only based on the centrifugal forces or filtration, we could also uh, improve the identification of benzyl letter in the sample. And uh, we also proved that the simple uh, chemical fractionation using anti-solvent uh, strategy is, is efficient to, to concentrate some LCC bonds in the sample. In this case, also, it was the case of the benzyl letter. Um, this NMR spectra that you can he see here just uh, show the position or the cross signals where we are expecting to have the LCC bonds and proving that our GGM sample was functionalized. Similarly, uh, we are just finalizing the preparation of a, a new manuscript using the GX from the birch. And we co could also identify the presence of the LCCs in the GX. Also here, we, prepare, we applied some fractionation methods in order to, to improve the identification. But uh, all this study came to, to give some answer for a question. One answer, actually give two answers. The first answer was the nature of the interaction between cellulose and lignin. And you could see that at least part of the lignin was covalently linked to the hemicellulose. And the other is, um, how this GGM and GX really act in the stabilization of the emulsion. So what we did in the continuation was prepare an emulsion using the, the samples, the various, some fractions that we prepared, and, uh, and then later recover the, the GGM and the GX from the interface. The interface here is, that one that is absorbed in the oil droplet. And then we also collect the, the, the GGM and GX that were uh, unadsorbed in the continuous phase, which was the water. And by collecting these different fractions of GGM and GX, uh, we, what we could see uh, was that the, they differed in terms of abundance, which means that the amount of GGM and GX in the oil droplet differed from that, from the continuous phase. Also the chemical structure was different and the behavior was different. And this uh, suggests to us that the function of the, the emulsifiers in the droplet interface is different also to the function that it performs in the continuous phase. Uh, this manuscript is still under preparation, so uh, I apologize to not give you more information about all the details, but uh, I hope that I can have the opportunity to comment on this 
in some other opportunity opportunity in the future. Uh, a summary and outlook from this uh, presentation, I could say that hemicellulose valorization require the elucidation of their chemical structure and the use uh, of advanced methods is of paramount importance because sometimes it's just the method that we are uh, usually to use maybe will not give us all the complexity that the, those structures can have. Uh, the other thing is that the purity of hemicellulose extract is not always an advantage for applications. I could see this in the film that when I was having hemicellulose, I was having xylan with other polysaccharides still uh, present. The formation of the film was much better than when I was using commercial xylan high purifiers. And I could see this also when uh, some lignin was preserved in the extracts for the emulsification, for example, because then uh, the different um, structures or different properties of the, these polymers, they complement each other in what the other lacks, for example, in hydrophobic uh, sites. And this is a great opportunity for the creation of mild mild uh, neutral and solvent-free extraction fractionation methods because sometimes uh, maybe we can be so worried about to improve purity but maybe uh, these components that still are there are bonus components for some application for example. Uh, also I could see that the functionalization of hemicellulose can design stable structures for target applications for example uh, the thermal stability was increased by some uh, modification and these can be orientated to some application where the thermal stability of the, the, the material is required. And uh, the hem cell losses also have potential for non traditional application, including in life size products. And in this case, here uh, I'm working now with the emotions. I have not like a, worked with emotion for food, but others in the group I'm, I am now, they are. So uh, we can open the possibilities of wood application to other things that sometimes we don't target classically. Yeah, and then just to finalize, uh, what I could see was that in, when I started in 2012, the doctoral studies, I could see that I was losing hemicellulose, and this doesn't fit, that was not um, closing the circular bioeconomy in, in my studies. But it is very important to, to create sustainable uh, methods and create uh, efficient resource valorization. And uh, what I can say is that starting to look for ways to utilize hemicellulose gave me possibility to create very interesting things. So let's start to create ways to not consider things as waste and consider it as raw materials for new applications and novel applications. Well, uh, here is my contact for those that are interested to continue this discussion in the future. Yes, and Thank you for the opportunity. I hope that this presentation can have give to you some good insights or good ideas for your own project. Thank you very much, Danilo, for your presentation. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, I, I will read them to you if that's okay. Uh, are you? Are you yeah, I can hear you only one okay. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first question is from Daniel Lima. Uh, is there any study about the application of hemicellulose that comes from the pre-hydrolysis process? Because this product has uh, different characteristics. From pre-hydrolysis? Pre-hydrolysis. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, I, in, 
I think that uh, what uh, Daniel is asking is this treatment just to using the water and temperature uh, in the, at least this is what I understand as pre-hydrolysis. This one that just apply water and temperature. I could say that this is quite similar to the process that was used for the preparation of this emulsifier agents that just applied some temperature, I don't know, variating from 160 to 170 for a determined time. And then at the end, it was obtained these extracts that reach in many cellulosis, but still contain other, um, other wood derivatives. So yeah, I would say that yes, and it, it, in this case, the these extracts were prepared with other purpose, and uh, was the main purpose to prepare these extracts. But of course, thinking in the circular economy, we can consider that if some industry is using the the hot this prehydrolysis for I don't know production of viscose, for example, there is really a reason to use this uh, extract later for other applications and uh, the recover the, the way to recover the the chemicals that is there is quite simple by a drying process for example and since no other chemical is used they they are quite safe and sustainable yes definitely yes okay thank you uh we have another question here from uh priscilla moreira uh, this island acetylation is an opportunity for biorefinery for dissolving pulp meal. Well, I think this is quite similar to the previous one because um, the process is pretty much the same. Yes, yes. Um, it can be, uh, although when you use only water for the extraction of the hemi cellulosis, they are not released uh, completely deacetylated. They still keep some acetylation because although uh, some acetyl groups are used for the process itself of this um, prehydrolysis or hot water extraction, because the source of chemical in this case is the acetylation, acetyl groups in the cellulosis. But uh, if it's necessary for some application, further acetylation can be, can be applied in order to get like high degree of acetylation, for example. Um, and we have another question here from Saif Gaham. Uh, have you measured the water barrier properties of the acetylated, acetylated xylan-based films? No, it was in the plan, but then the equipment have some problems and then the, well, yeah, but this is something, um, the, something to be considered, especially if you are uh, thinking use for some packaging. Uh, product because then, yeah. yeah. We know how research works <laughs> with this yeah. arrow challenge. Well. <laughs> uh, uh, we have another question here from Dalton Long. Uh, congrats, Daniela, for your presentation. Uh, about dialogue management in pulp and paper industry, in your opinion, is it better to remove it before cooking or keep the most as possible in the fiber line? Well, Dalton, this is difficult. <laughs> I don't know for what they are going to use this pulp. Depend, maybe depending of the application, you want to uh, actually depending of the application, the the xylem, the presence of xylem can can perform very interesting um, actions. For example, the in absorption of water or something that's complicated. I think it really depends of the purpose and. Uh, yeah, really depend on the purpose. What I could see in this study is that if it's not really necessary, it's also, uh, like intense purification, don't do that because you are going to use too much like energy chemicals and maybe you are going to lose some functionality that is there and then you are going to add some additive later to re replace this, this thing that you have lost. But it, it really depends of uh, the the application that you are targeted for. Well, Daniela, this was the last question that we have here. Uh, 
Thank you very much again for your presentation. Uh, congratulations, it was Thank great. You. Um, and everyone, we are gonna take a quick break. We wanted to keep on schedule. Uh, our next uh, talk is gonna be at 3.30 uh, Brazilian time. So we'll be, back, we'll be back soon, stay tuned, bye-bye.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, uh, I'll be, uh, if you are just joining us, uh, I'll, I am Juliana Jardim. I'll be chairing the last session of the second international virtual seminar on wood pulp and biorefinery. Uh, and our next speaker is Dr. Samahan Salang, and he has just finished his PhD in forest biotiers here at MC State. Uh, I had the pleasure to work with him. Uh, we are in the same research group, uh, so I can tell you that he has done some excellent work. He has won a couple of awards. He has filed a patent and published some high quality papers. Uh, today, he will be talking to us about the, dynamic of, the dynamics of cellulose water interactions uh, from nanoscale to macroscale to unravel the, its effects on fiber and papers production. Um, if you have any questions, please submit it to the chat. Remember to uh, start with hashtag questions, and then I will read it to him uh, after his presentation. So, Dr. Salem, I will hand it to you now. You can share your presentation. Thank you, uh, Juliana, for the introduction, and thank you, the uh, uh, arranger uh, who have arranged this uh, such a great uh, seminar and conference. It's my pleasure to be here and share my work that I have done in for my PhD. So I'll just share my uh, screen with you all, and uh, so just to make sure if everyone is, uh, can you uh, see my slides clearly? Yes, I can see your slides. All right, so I'll just uh, start from here. Uh, welcome to my presentation, uh, dear all. So my uh, topics is uh, the dynamics of cellulose water interaction from the nanoscale to macroscale to unravel its effects on fiber and paper properties. Uh, this is my. This has been my PhD defense work, and uh, I just finished my PhD last month, same date, April 27, 2021. So yeah, it's been a month, and uh, I'm really, really honored to present this work again with such a uh, kind and uh, esteemed audience. So uh, the work I'm presenting it will uh, contain the motivation of my research, the objectives. Uh, literature survey, that's an introduction part. And I'll present, uh, I have divided it into two sections. One is uh, uh, the nanofibrils, I mean the nanoscale one, and then another one is the uh, macroscale, that's the, how the cellulose water interaction affects the uh, fiber properties as well. And as oil. <clears throat> at the end, uh, I will uh, just summarize my data and uh, I'll, I'll really, uh, looking forward to get some exciting questions from you, which can further uh, uh, kind of uh, bolster my uh, work in future. So motivation. Uh, my motivation has been always the food. Uh, I, 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 I really like to, uh, enjoy, I really like enjoying uh, having different cuisines and food. So yeah, food security and uh, the single use plastic remediation has been my motivation. Uh, so so food, it has been a really, really, uh, it plays a very important role in our life. Now, from the very beginning of the social life of mankind, we have been living in a food-centric society uh, where food is a form of social currency. And the U.S. packaging trend shows that the advent of modern and fast city life made us more dependent on the processed food and disposables, which has contributed to a massive increase in amount of municipal solid waste and negatively impacting the environment. While the European Union has banned the single-use plastic in 2018, approximately 82 million tons of containers and packaging waste were generated in the United States, major part of which ended in the landfill in China. However, the China's ban on world's recycled waste hit the United States the hardest due to its lack of cost-effective waste management and has appeared as a blessings in disguise as it offers opportunity to develop better solutions for a growing through agriculture and avid single-use plastic waste. So the social awareness and the government regulations has triggered an environment-friendly bio-based circular economy uh, for future where 
the sustainability and the biodegradability will be the top trend. Food safety and performance are and will be the market drive. And the potential solution is the lignocellulose and cellulose-based fibers and nanofibers development to enhance the functionalities of bioproducts. Cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on earth found in trees, uh, waste from agriculture crops and other biomass like and bacteria. Cellulose nanofibers is a polymorph of cellulose having diameter less than 100 nanometer, which can be produced by grinding the cellulose and can also be obtained from bacteria sources. The unique technological appeal of CNF has made it potential for applications in paper and tissue paper products, specialty products, uh, bioplastics, protective packagings, and so on. However, such as uh, high potential of CNF comes with some few challenges as well. The high energy consumption and the self-aggregation during preparation, low solid content and dewatering and high sensitivity of moisture has been the uh, challenges to overcome. But despite these limitations, CNF offers following advantages, uh, which opens up lots of opportunities. High tensile strength, modulus, comparable to metal and alloy, densely distributed hydroxyl groups, which are critical for forming abundant inter and intramolecular hydrogen bonds and prospects for chemical functionalization and hybridization. The rich hydroxyl groups on CNF provide opportunities for chemical modification to overcome the limitations. Commonly used chemical modification of CNF are temp oxidation, esterification, etherification, amidation, carbamation, polymer grafting, and so on, like cellulation and et cetera. However, in my work, I have uh, used the esterification. I have chosen the esterification for chemical modification. Now, what is esterification or what is acetylation? Esterification is a kind of acetylation uh, process where the acetyl group is bonded to the cellulose hydroxyls. This has some few benefits as uh, it, <clears throat> the degree of substitution could be kept uh, below 1.5 where it enhanced the uh, uh, hydrophobicity as well as it could maintain the native crystalline structure. And it also made the CNF better dispersible in the non-polar solvent and matrix. So uh, now the research, uh, 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 the first part of the research, which is the elucidation of the cellulose nanofibrils chemical reactivity and the functional properties. My studying uh, material was southern bleached hard craft pulp and the starting consistency was 3%. And I used the mazuka grinder to uh, buy and vary the energy using different passes to produce the nanocellulose. This is the schematic representation, which shows uh, the production of the CNF suspension, where I pass the, uh, 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 the pulp through the grinder, where one of the grinding stone could rotate and one was fixed and keep the gap with uh, in, in negative so that uh, uh, the it could grind a, a cellulose fibers to nanofibrils and produce the suspension. Then I uh, carried out this chemical modification where I took the CNF gel mixed with uh, chemicals that is acetic anhydride and I used acetic acid as a uh, catalyst. I uh, then put it in the hot plate styrer and keep the temperature around 80 degrees Celsius and ran the reactions for an hour. And the mixture was filtered and washed to remove the unreacted acetic anhydride after one hour and we could get the modified nanocellulose. Further, the modification was confirmed by uh, doing the FTIR, where the modified nanocellulose showed that appearance of new peaks around 740, 1370, and 2029, which are the characteristic peak of acetyl group. And thus, it confirms the addition and attachment of the uh, acetyl group onto the cellulose, nanocellulose surface. So uh, the fine contents and the associated available surface area increased with the increase of supply, energy supply due to delamination of the, uh, the uh, cellulose to nanocellulose. And you can see as we the, uh, move, as we put more and more energy, which is uh, denoted by the 2K, 3K, 4K, 5K, that is 2000 kilowatt ton hour, kilowatt hour per ton, 3000 kilowatt per hour, kilowatt hour per ton. And we could say that uh, the fine contents increased, uh, which uh, kind of shows how the nanofibrils were producing, 
produce were have been produced from the uh, uh, cellulose fiber, and the crystallinity index also shows that uh, with the increase of the energy due to delamination, more and more uh, amorphous region were coming could be produced, and thus the crystallinity index uh, decreased uh, as as we uh, supply more and more energy. This is the SCM image, uh, which shows the delamination uh, resulted in higher degree of fibrillation. Uh, the figure shows that cellulose fiber changes to cellulose nanofibrils as we supply more and more energy. And uh, this is the uh, uh, cellulose fiber at zero kilowatt hour. That means the pristine cellulose fiber. And as we add more and more energy, we could say that uh, we, the, there is much, much finer fibrils were produced. And finally, at higher, much higher energy, that's 5,000 kilowatt hour, we could find that, we could uh, say that this is the uh, nanocellulose uh, fibrils uh, that we have produced. And degree of, then we further calculate, we measured the uh, reaction and calculate the degree of uh, uh, substitution. And the degree of substitution is the av average number of substituent group attached per monomeric unit. So we could say that uh, after the initially uh, with the increase of uh, energy as the fibrillation increased, the degree of substitution increased. So from uh, this part, this part is up to 3000 uh, kilowatt hour per ton energy. This part is um, uh, kind of expected because as we fibril more and as we fibrillate more, more and more hydroxyl groups will be exposed to the surface for reaction and will be available for the reaction and substituted by the acetyl group. However, after reaching a certain, after reaching this uh, certain energy, uh, the um, uh, degree of substitution, that is the reactivity decreased. And though the energy was supplied was increased and the fibrillation increased. So this, uh, this uh, uh, decrease in the degree of substitution was unexpected. And uh, uh, we did not expect, we all, uh, this was not the, the hypothesis. This does not align with our initial uh, uh, hypothesis. So what we did, we uh, took the uh, nanocellular samples again and diluted to the same consistency. We ran the same reaction again and did the acetylation, measured the FTIR to confirm their substitution. And then also, uh, uh, measure the degree of substitution again. And we could see that uh, we, the similar trend was followed like before. Uh, the nanocellular, I mean, the, with the increase of the energy, they reached a maximum value. And after reaching a maximum value, with the increase of energy and fibrillation, the degree of substitution decreased. However, we could say that the overall value of the degree of substitution was lower for the diluted samples compared to the original one. And this one uh, is a kind of was a, um, uh, this one, this is really interesting. And we were really trying to find out what is happening there. And uh, because this is not our uh, initial hypothesis. So, I mean, uh, and this was, I was really, uh, 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 perplexed having seen this uh, reaction and I was thinking uh, where I can find this solution because this is uh, this is I was really really initial stage of my uh, PhD research and uh, so I was it, it, it kind of really took me by surprise so so and uh, uh, these people were not present now and uh, I was thinking where, where who, who, who will be the person where I can go and find the explanation what's happening here. So, and um, one of my favorite uh, favorite uh, professor, and I was not, I was really, really was not uh, confident to uh, ask him if we can go uh, share this result because if this makes sense or not. And uh, then I, this gentleman, Dr. A, and my uh, PhD advisors, uh, we really, I, they really helped me to come up with uh, a new hypothesis and uh, that uh, 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 some uh, design some new experimental matrix to come up with the uh, explanation what's going on uh, when we use uh, such a high uh, fibrillation uh, energy and why the 
uh, CNF uh, reactivity decreases after reaching the maximum point. So what we did, uh, the initial uh, uh, hypothesis that the fibrillation increases and that uh, with the increase of fibrillation, the degree of substitution will increase. But we could, so, um, we could say that the presence of the water uh, kind of regulates the reaction and the water surrounding the reaction sites as it increases, uh, the degree of substitution decreases, which we found that uh, due to deletion of the CNF and the, at the same energy, the degree of substitution was lower compared to the origin one. So what is happening here? The thing is the water is kind of uh, dynamically forming hydrogen bonds around the, with the cellulose uh, and, uh, and the and the water adjacent to the water, they're also forming the hydrogen bond. And they are kind of forming a hydrogen hydration shell around the CNF uh, and uh, the uh, hydroxyl group of the CNF that kind of uh, act as a barrier for the acetyl group to come in contact and could not, and uh, which uh, kind of decrease the uh, reactivity of the cellular surface. So, so what we did to uh, find how the nanocellulose and water uh, kind of interact uh, uh, and how the of the water is really, really affecting the reactivity of the cellulose. So we know that uh, there are uh, two types of water, the free water and the bound water. And the schematic showing where the free, the free water is the bulk water and the bound water is the water that's uh, kind of form, that form hydrogen bond or really adjacent to the initial one or first or second surface of, uh, of the cellulose hydroxyl. And uh, uh, there is another kind of water that is trapped water, which is formed when you try to dry the sample and few uh, water are uh, getting gets trapped uh, inside the uh, uh, matrix. So the trapped water and the bound water, uh, they form the hack to remove. And what we did, we for the each sample and see, we could say that with the increase of energy, the hack to remove water per a glycosyl ring, this is represented more per mole, increase drastically. And after surpassing the 3000 uh, kilo, what hour per ton energy, it's it's really, really high. It increases exponentially. And we could say that the, due to this, this increase, in, increase in the how to remove water, the number of hydration shell around the cellular uh, nanofibrils increases. This uh, hydration shell, uh, increase in the hydration shell, decreases the reactivity of the cellulose nanofibrils um, uh, when it uh, after reaching the maximum uh, reactivity. So we uh, the glycosyl ring has three hydroxyl groups and each of those can react with two waters. And each subsequent hydrogen cell is formed by outer two water interacting with an inner water. That is the six water can interact with 12 water and the 12 water will further interact with 24 waters and further interact 48 waters and 96 water, and thus it goes on. And so with the increase of the hard to remove water content and the bound water content, so the hydrogen shell does increases, which kinds of, uh, 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 which kind of explain why the uh, reactivity of the nanocellulose decreases after reaching a maximum point after a certain time. So further to uh, confirm this kind of trend, what we did, Oh, we prepared the nanocellulose samples in two ways. One is solvent exchange way, where we took the nanocellulose and we used the ethanol to uh, remove the water uh, using the uh, centrifuge method, and we produced solvent exchange CNF. And in other way, in other case, we open write the CNF to produce at 105 degrees Celsius for 24 hour, 24 hour and produce the open dry nanocellulose samples. And then we did the acetylation reactions following the same method. Here is the uh, acetylation. Uh, 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 here is the data for the degree of substitution, which we calculate measured after the acetylation of those uh, samples. And we could say that for the solvent exchanged CNF, the trend of the uh, reactivity is same. The reactivity increased initially, and after reaching a maximum, the reactivity of the nanocellulose decreased. For the oven dry sample, the degree of substitution decreased with the increase of the nanocellulose uh, energy. And uh, the increase of the degree of substitution 
was due to uh, the decrease in the haploid removed water. So when we exchange the solvent uh, with the ethanol, there was a much, much less haploid removed water, almost no haploid removed water. So well, we could say that there is high increased, high jump of the degree of substitution. The reactivity of the nanocellular really, really increased um, uh, for the solvent exchange uh, compared to the uh, water containing nanocellulose. But still it decreased and the, the decrease in the degree of substitution was this due to another factor which is known as self-aggregation and intrinsic properties of the nanocellulose. And the uh, open dry nanocellulose also shows that uh, uh, the degree of substitution decreases uh, as the energy was uh, increased. And this is due to the uh, self-aggregation. And uh, uh, when we dried the sample, uh, much, much, uh, I mean, aggregation uh, kind of increased with the increase of uh, uh, energy supply and thus the reactivity of the nanocellulose decreased. So, uh, oh, we also did the Tofsim reaction uh, to further confirm the uh, uh, how how the <coughs> uh, Tofsim reaction to further confirm uh, the uh, acetylation of the uh, nanofibrils, and you can see that the CNF as we go from CNF to modified uh, CNF, so the red zone kind of uh, was higher compared to the uh, uh, nanocellulose, only the nanocellulose, unmodified nanocellulose, and it shows that the acetylation increased. And for the solvent exchange nanocellulose, the, it was much, much higher compared to the other two. So uh, it uh, shows that the, uh, it kind of correlates with our previous findings, showing that the acetylation increased, I mean, substitution or the reactivity increased with a solvent exchange method. Now, when we, then we try to find out uh, how the solvent exchange method uh, will kind of increase the uh, reactivity. So what we did, we measured the bound water and the hard to remove water content uh, for the samples. And we could see that the bound water, both the bound water and the hard to remove water decreased as the water amount in the sample decreased. That is, as we go from 100% water to 50% water to 10% water, uh, the hard to remove water and bound with water much decreased, much, much lower. And thus, uh, it increased the reactivity. We also measured the surface tension using the pendant, pendant drop method. And we could find that the decrease in the surface tension, uh, there was decrease in the surface tension due to increase um, of the ethanol content, i.e. that is, decrease in the water content. And this uh, decrease in the surface, con uh, uh, surface tension facilitated uh, the uh, movement of the acetyl group into towards the cellulose surface and uh, resulted in higher substitution, i.e. higher reactivity. We further uh, studied uh, this interaction using NMR. We measured the proton chemical shift in the glucose water system to understand the potential hydrogen hydration shell structure. As glucose concentration is increased, water proton shifts from larger PPM to smaller PPM. Thus water become more electron dense and closely packed forming hydrogen shell. This is a mimic of fiber saturation point of the cellulose water system. So if you see the graph, you could say that uh, initially when 100% water, uh, this is a schematic, uh, the water are kind of scatteredly arranged around the fibrillar surface. And as we um, uh, go towards the saturation, so we could see that the water proton shifts and uh, it becomes more densely packed. And uh, finally, at the saturation point, the water really, really densely packed and on the, uh, forming a, uh, a very strong hydrogen shell. And this hydrogen shell kind of uh, decreased the reactivity. We also did the same uh, um, uh, uh, study but using when what water and ethanol mixture, and we could find that uh, the proton shift it follows a similar trend, but the proton shift was higher for the water ethanol mixture compared to the water. And at the saturation point, uh, uh, it was it took higher uh, um, it took a longer time to get saturated. 
for the water ethanol and long a higher concentration to get saturated for water ethanol uh, uh, system. And it shows that with, when you add the ethanol, the hydrogen shell is not as compact as the water protein, as only the water uh, system does. The water ethanol system could facilitate more uh, and had red group uh, to the uh, uh, reaction site and increase the reactivity of the system. We also measured them, did some uh, molecular dynamic simulation, and uh, we also measured the radial distribution function. The radial distribution function is the probability of finding molecules as a water as a function of distance. And we generated the nanofibrils using cellulose binder tool, having box dimension of 10.38, 3.318 nanometer. We keep the periodic boundary conditions. The simulations using the LAMPS package uh, with a time step of two femtoseconds. After the CNF reached equilibrium, we use the Monte Carlo steps. Uh, the Monte Carlo steps were added to insert the water molecule uh, at a random orientation. The molecular dynamic steps allowed the movement of the CNF substrate, which results in more realistic representation of the experimental system. The combined Monte Carlo and molecular dynamic simulation was ran for 70 nanoseconds in total, with the first 10 seconds used for number of water molecules to reach equilibrium, sufficiently for water molecules to explore all the possible states of cellular surface. And finally, the, 60, the final 60 seconds was used for data analysis. The radial distribution functions of the water atom around the cellulose is plotted to show the interaction between the water molecule and the cellulose. And it shows that uh, the distance, the, sh the short distance peak at 2.3 angstrom, demonstrating the strong electrostatic interaction between the water molecule and the cellulose. The RDF also showed a secondary peak at 4.4 angstrom, which arises from intermolecular hydrogen bonding of water molecule with the first layer of water, which I have shown you. So the thing is, we could see that with the addition of the ethanol, uh, and with the increase of the concentration of the ethanol, the presence of water around the cellular surface decreased. And this can be also shown by the, the, uh, the images I captured. And this uh, kind of uh, correlates with all the findings we have, the NMR, the surface tension, uh, uh, and the, uh, also the uh, bound water and the how to remove water content. And thus those, uh, and it can, it helps to explain how uh, the presence of this the uh, uh, hydrogen shell, which is formed due to presence of a uh, higher amount of bound water, uh, affects the reactivity of the nanocellulose. This is a schematic uh, uh, represent representation of the cellulose water, CNF water dynamics. And we could see that uh, for the uh, water and acidic and hydrate system, uh, the hydrogen shell is much, much stronger. And thus, only a few amount of acidic and hydrate molecule could penetrate and reach to the surface for reaction. However, for the water and ethan, water ethanol system, uh, the hydrogen shell was not much stronger as the water only uh, water system. And thus more cellulose nanofibrils could interact with the acidic anhydride and thus the reactivity increased. Further, we also investigated the self-aggregation due to formation of hydrogen bond between the hydroxyl groups of the nanofibril samples by size measurement of different uh, nanocellular samples by dynamic light scattering techniques. And we could find that the diameter of the CNF agglomerates in the suspension increased with the um, increase in uh, energy. The increase was significantly overwhelming high after reaching the 3000 kilowatt hour per ton energy, which explains why the degree of substitution went down drastically. Uh, below when higher energy was uh, applied uh, above, beyond this energy. The tendency of the nanofibrils to form flocculates by hydrogen bonding is due to their high aspect ratio and hydrophilic nature, which leads to self-aggregation of the surface. And thus the reactivity diminishes after reaching the maximum. So this is our re uh, research hypothesis, the uh, degree of substitution the, and the degree of fibrillation. And we could say that the chemical reactivity is the combined effect of extent of fibrillation, the bound water, and the self-aggregation. And this work has demonstrated that surface modification can be controlled through adjusting the 
extent of fibrillation of nanofibrils by varying cumulative fibrillating energy supply. And we have published one journal article uh, based on this work. Further, uh, we calculated the uh, barrier application for these films and how this reactivity kind of affects the uh, uh, barrier properties of the nanocellulose films. And uh, we prepared, uh, we acetylated uh, and modified the nanocellulose in the same way. And then we diluted the modified suspension and using the film casting method, we produced the dry film. And then we measured the water vapor transmission rate, oil and grease resistance, mechanical strength, contact angle, and surface energy. Also did the optical profilometer, shelf life, and biodegradability. So we measured the water vapor transmission rate using the wet cup method. And you could see that the water vapor increase, transmission rate decreased uh, with the increase in the modification, with the mm, increase in the modification or degree of modification of the nanofibrillar cellulose. And you could see that it was um, maximum for the uh, uh, nanofibrils produced at 3000 kilowatt hour energy. So the highest reactivity uh, of the nanofibrils made it more hydrophobic, thus the water vapor transmission decreased for the nanofibrils. Then we also did the barrier test properties uh, of uh, like, uh, measuring the oil grease resistance. We used the TAPI kit test for oil and grease resistance, uh, the TAPI standard test. And we could find that uh, the cellulose, modified cellulose, unmodified cellulose, uh, and the, even the creased surface of the modified cellulose, they shows very high oil and grease resistance. All of them pass the 12 kit rating uh, compared to the uh, regular paper, which shows the failure uh, at the left side of the picture. So then we also did the hot oil barrier test. We use red dye, which was mixed with corn oil at 0.1% concentration. We keep the temperature at 65 degrees Celsius and pour the specimen to a depth of three millimeter and keep it for 20 minutes. And you could see that after 20 minutes, there is no stain, which shows that the cellulose film passed the hot oil barrier test. Further, we keep the barrier, we keep this, uh, we did the test for 24 hours and only we could see that the oil only leaked from the cellulose nanofibrils at very lower energy, but for the uh, nanofibrils produced, produced at higher energy, and also for the modified nanofibrils, there was no leak uh, for the test. And thus, those pass the hot oil barrier test showing very high oil and grease resistance. We also measured the contact angle of the films, and we could see that contact angle increases with the fibrillation. And we also found that the contact angle increases uh, with degree of substitution due to increase of the hydrophobicity. We also measured the surface roughness of the films and uh, we could see that the surface roughness uh, kind of decreased with the uh, fibrillation and thus it affected the contact angle, uh, which increased with the surface smoothness. The higher surface smoothness uh, resulted in higher contact angle and thus better barrier properties. The surface roughness does not change much with the uh, modification. However, due to presence of the acetyl group, uh, the contact angle increased. And this also explains why the modification, uh, um, the due to modification, the contact angle increased uh, for the uh, nanofibrils surface. So we measured the surface energy of the uh, CNF nanofibrils uh, using the sessile drops method at room temperature 23 degrees Celsius. And we also use Wentz Wentz geometric mean equation to estimate the surface energy from contact angle. And we could found that uh, the surface energy decreased as the contact angle was, uh, and the contact angle was increased with the fibrillation. If, and we also found that, uh, that we also measured the, uh, uh, we also observed the effect of chemical modification. And uh, for, uh, for each of the uh, nanocellulose uh, prepared at each conditions, uh, for the modified samples, the surface energy decreased and the contact angle increased. And it, this is uh, uh, this kind of was observed for all the uh, uh, nanocellulose that produced in two kilowatt hour, three kilowatt hour per ton, four kilowatt hour, and five kilowatt hour per ton energy. And so uh, the, both the fibrillation and the chemical modification decreased the surface energy 
and increase the contact angle and thus increase the uh, uh, hydrophobicity of the uh, nanofibrillar cellulose and also the higher oil and grease resistance. Tensile properties, we used instant tensile tester, the standard method to uh, measure the tensile properties. And we could find that the tensile properties was higher for the nanofibrils unmodified. However, with the extent of modification, the tensile in A properties decrease. This is uh, uh, kind of underst understandable because uh, with the um, attachment of the acetyl group, uh, so the uh, the uh, closeness of the nanofibrils to each other and the uh, hydrogen bond decreases uh, since the uh, acetyl group uh, replaces all the uh, hydroxyl groups. Uh, uh, not all the hydroxyl group, most of the hydroxyl group of the uh, sample and thus the tensile index, uh, tensile index decreases because the hydrogen bond is uh, responsible for the increase in the, uh, for the higher tensile index of the nanofibrils uh, in the system. So then we also measured the stretching and we could find that the stretching uh, kind of uh, stretching increased with the energy and as well as with the modification. And this is also uh, understandable because uh, with the, uh, as we go from lower to higher energy, the curl index of the uh, sample uh, decreased. And this, this uh, facilitates uh, to uh, mobility of the nanofibrils one over another. And also the modification also uh, helped to uh, increase the stretching because uh, due to uh, decrease of hydrogen bond, uh, the, the uh, cellulose uh, fibrils could glide over one another uh, due to modification. And this is the flexibility of, uh, you can say that the film form was much, much flexible uh, 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 though it has very high tensile strength. So uh, further, we also measured the shelf life of the nanofibrils uh, and uh, the shelf life of the film were ma measured using the weatherometer. Uh, the rate of irradiation was kept 1.10 uh, watt per meter square. The total irradiance was 396 kilojoule per meter square in 72 hours in four cycles, which is equivalent to six months of outdoor environment. Cellulose nanofibrils at uh, unmodified cellulose nanofibrils at lower energy uh, could not withstand this kind of uh, 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 harsh environment. And it was okay till the third cycle, but when we use the fourth cycle, it kind of ruptured. And there was slight rupture in the uh, nanofibrils produced at 3K also. However, when you move to higher energy, that's 4K, and for the modified uh, nanofibrils, there's, uh, it was, uh, uh, it could uh, withstand up to four cycle and uh, which is equivalent to six months of outdoor environment, which shows that the higher energy and as well as the modification improved the uh, uh, mechanical and the uh, tensile strength of the nanofibrils so that it could last longer for outdoor activity. Also, we measured the biodegradability of the nanofibrils. So we, they put the nanofibrils in a uh, soil, and uh, after uh, and we regular monitored uh, the uh, nanofibrils and the uh, how the it's degrading or not. Uh, the and we could say that uh, after forty days, after forty days, those nanofibrils are degraded to much much uh, uh, degree. Uh, the size of the nanofibrils uh, film decreased, and uh, we could uh, clearly see the degradation. However, the polystyrene after 40 days was as kind of, there is no change actually. And this makes sense because most of the petroleum based plastic, it takes hundreds of years to degrade owing to their cross-linked covalent bonds, particularly the strong carbon carbon bonds. In contrast, the oxygenated molecular chain of cellulose can be degraded by bacteria, fungi, and yeast that occur naturally in soil. This combination of excellent biodegradability, outstanding mechanical strength, high heat and chemical resistance of the nanofibril films suggest it can be potentially used as an alternative for plastics such as polyethylene polystyrene and polyethylene terephthalate. So I'll now present my second part, which is the uh, uh, how the water dynamics, cellulose water dynamics affect the macromolecular state. And uh, so as I discussed earlier, there is, uh, uh, two different kinds of water, free water, 
or capillary water or intercellular water and bound water or absorbed water. And bound water can be categorized into non-freezing and freezing bound water. So how this free water and bound water is produced? The charge difference between the oxygen and hydrogen of cellulose hydroxyl is lower than the corresponding charge difference of the water molecule. And this difference favors the formation of cellulose water interaction, uh, which consequently leads to cellulose water hydrogen bond formation. When all the substance sites are saturated with water molecule from, um, from cluster uh, through water-water hydrogen bonds, which are less stronger than the cellulose water hydrogen bonds, this gives rise to heterogeneity of water mobility, where the slow moving water is known as bound water and the fast moving water is known as free water. The cellulose water hydrogen bond uh, has higher energy than water water hydrogen bond in the fiber, which increases the uh, local minima corresponding to the bound water, which is uh, uh, lower than the uh, free water. That is the potential energy of the bound water is much, much lower than the free water. And that's why it's more and more, uh, uh, yeah, it, ha it, it takes higher energy to uh, remove the bound water um, compared to the free water. So, and it takes almost uh, that. Uh, does it increase the average lifetime of the cellulose bound water? Uh, uh, since the hydrogen bond uh, is uh, is increased relatively by two order of magnitude compared to the bulk water. And the entropy of the absorbed, absorbed water molecule in the substance side decreases, which, is, which in turn increases the stability of the bound water and requires higher energy for drying to overcome capillary forces. Thus, bound water along with the trapped water forms hard to remove water. Now, this is a mechanism of fiber collapsing what happens when we try to remove or dry the uh, cell and try uh, dry the cellulose and, and remove the uh, water? We could say that the fiber wall in the figure A is saturated with water. And as we try to remove the water, the fiber experience pulling force due to removal of water uh, due to presence of very, very high surface tension. The cellulose water hydrogen bond breaks and the cellulose, cellulose hydrogen bonds forms. The water hydroxyl has higher dipole moment than cellulose hydroxyl. The difference in dipole moment is compensated by fiber deformation. And the fiber is fully collapsed when the hydrogen bonding and the fiber-fiber interaction overwhelms the elastic force of the fiber lumen, which prefers the opening conformation. And this is the uh, 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 simulation which shows how when we try to remove the water, how the uh, uh, fibers comes close to each other and uh, 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 suffer collapsing, which is known as fiber, which is known as uh, fiber hornification as well. So, and uh, this is the schematic representation of the fiber collapsing. The fiber cell wall is saturated in the figure A and B and only hard to remove water is uh, available left in the look picture uh, as shown in the C. As we try to dry it more, the collapsing begins and fiber fully collapses when all the almost all the water is removed at point C, point E. So uh, we also measured uh, how the hydration affecting the uh, fiber morphology, and we could find that uh, the hard to remove water and the bound hard to remove water uh, uh, in, in, and the bound water increases the, with the increase of the uh, initial moisture content. And when we try to remove this uh, moisture content, we could see that uh, the fiber pore wall uh, uh, decreases as the moisture content is decreased. And this is the, uh, the SEM image shows step-by-step step how the fiber is collapsing as we remove the bound water and how to remove water. We also measure how the refining uh, is affecting the fiber morphology. And we could see that with the increase of refining, the freeness decreases, uh, and uh, the uh, hard to remove water and the bound water increases. The increase in the uh, uh, hard to remove water and the bound water is due to opening up of the microscopic spaces in the laminar structure of the fiber cell wall. Thus, it can accommodate more and more water into the surface 
uh, into the newer substance sites and form hydrogen bond with the newly exposed cellulose hydroxyls, which increases the bound and hard to remove water content of the bulb. And the ACM image shows that the refined fibers suffer more collapsing than the unrefined fiber due to its higher hard to remove water content and holding capacity than the unrefined fiber. And so here is the, uh, to summarize my all the work, uh, we get uh, the CNF samples, we prepared it successfully and chemically, where it's chemically modified. And we could see that the three factors, the bound water are hard to remove water, that it, which forms the hydration cell, the fibrillation and the self aggregation uh, affects the extent of reactivity of the nanocellular samples. Uh, we also measured how the chemical uh, reactivity affects the uh, functional properties. The water vapor uh, decreased with the increase of fibrillation as well as with the increase of uh, degree of substitution. The CNF films modified and unmodified showed excellent oil and grease resistance, the surface smoothness, hydrophobicity, enhanced the contact angle and decreased the surface energy. The tensile strength increased with fibrillation extent and decreased uh, as the degree of substitution decreased. The stretching increased with an increase in both fibrillation extent and degree of substitution. Shelf life of the film increased with the fibrillation and degree of substitution. All the modified and unmodified cellulose nanofibrils showed biodegradability. And this work uh, has demonstrated how chemical modification of the nanofibril surface can be controlled by manipulating the extent of fibrillation of the nanofibrils and consequently affect the barrier properties of the CNF films. We also show that there are different types of water present in the uh, uh, cellulose surface and how the trapped water, bound water, forming how to remove water uh, affect the fiber collapsing due to high surface tension. Uh, so the fiber is fully collapsed when the hydrogen bond and the fiber-fiber interaction overwhelms the elastic force of the fiber lumen. The refining opens up submicroscopic space within the laminar structure of the fiber of the cell wall, which enable increased cellulose water interaction. Bound and hard to remove water increases due to refining and fiber suffer higher collapsing when dried. So uh, the end, so uh, I am really, really grateful to my advisors, Dr. Paul, Dr. Lucia, Dr. Jamil, Dr. Khan, and uh, my research group, my, so Dr. Lucian, Dr. Paul, who advised me. So I'm really, uh, I have a uh, grateful to my research group, both the Paul's group and the Lucian group. And also I'd like to thank Dr. Vindete, Dr. Martin, Dr. Pasquilini, Lavoine. And uh, thank you. I'm uh, excited to, uh, get some questions from comments and suggestions from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salen, for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is from Priscila Moreira. Uh, have you ever studied the interaction of CNF and coagulants? So, uh, Juliana, can you, uh, can you? Uh, repeat your question? Yeah, because, yeah. Sure. It's, um, this question comes from Priscilla Moreira, uh, and she asks, have you ever studied the interaction of CNF and coagulants? CNF and coagulants? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Yes. Uh, uh, so I have studied the uh, CNF and coagulants. Actually, I think I can show you the slide. Just give me one second. Yeah. Take your time. I mean, yeah. Uh, this one, this one. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Actually, uh, yeah, this one is the, uh, I, I studied it in two ways, using me measuring the uh, hydrodynamic volume of the, coagulants of the CNF. Also, I also uh, measured the turbidity as well. So to see how the CNF coagulants kind of, uh, how the energy uh, affect the uh, hydrodynamic volume. And that's the CNF coagulants or flux of CNF. And I found that uh, 
with the increase of energy, the flux of CNF and or we can say the coagulation of the CNF increases. And those uh, increase was due to higher interaction of the uh, hydrogen bond of the nanofibrils. And those uh, higher uh, interaction uh, kind of decrease the reactivity, if that answered the questions. Thank you. Uh, and we have another question here from uh, Maria Teresa Nunes. Uh, did you evaluate the effects of these interactions uh, in any other applications? So the for the CNF or the cellulose interaction for any kind of application, Shelley? The, for, for the interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the question is, if I have, as am just, uh, trying to make sure I have uh, listened to the correct. So if I have also tried for other application, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. Uh, this, my nanofibrils work, this is my actually site project. Uh, my main focus was uh, the application on tissue properties and the packaging properties as well. Um, unfortunately, so I didn't have the permission to present that data. But yes, I had to, uh, the simplest answer would be yes, I have uh, studied the other applications and yes, we have some very good uh, data and that's the patent pending actually. So maybe okay. after that. Nice. Yeah. Um, let me see if we have any other question here. Yeah, these were the two questions. I guess you're very, very clear. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation again. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. It was very, very rich presentation. Thank you, Julian. And I'd like to thank the uh, persons who have arranged this seminar and reached out to me. I'm really, really honored. If anyone has further questions, uh, they can uh, email me. I'll be really yeah, happy maybe, to answer. Yeah, them. maybe go back. Do you have your contact uh, in your last email, uh, in your last slide? Maybe you can go back to there. Okay. Um, oh, we got another question. Okay. Uh, just a second. Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> what do you think that is the biggest challenge to nanocellulose achieve the biggest industry scale? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. The biggest challenge is the, I mean, uh, the amount of solid content of the consistency we are producing it. So when we try to prepare, so for the bleach pulp, uh, yeah, we can take maximum 3% starting consistency. And, uh, but for the, I have also tried uh, the unbleached pulp. So that's, that's re that's even harder and 1.5 to 2% consistency is the maximum consist starting consistency. So yeah, so to produce, to find a, I mean, so when we uh, convert it to the oven dry weight, so that's, so if we produce a huge amount of uh, gel, so it just, we get good, uh, very, a handful of uh, oven dry CNF. And uh, that's the biggest challenge, maybe if we can, Somehow, if we can increase the starting consistency or the solid content of the nanofibril cellulose, I mean, that will really, really, uh, I mean, will explore the, uh, made it easier for the nanofibril section. Well, thank you very much for your insight on that. Thank you. Uh, and you've got lots of compliments uh, for your presentation on the chat. I know that you cannot say it right now, but you got lots of compliments. Yeah, you can take the screenshot and send to me. <laughs> Hello, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I like compliments. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> well, and I would like to congratulate uh, who is behind the scenes, you know, that make this uh, wonderful seminar happen. We are experiencing very challenging times, and this is a very good opportunity for us to keep connected, to keep learning. Uh, learning from different backgrounds. And I was very honored to be invited to be here chairing this last session of uh, the second edition of this seminar. And it was great uh, 
seeing you here, seeing uh, Dr. Carvalho before in a, uh, the talk right before yours it was amazing as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today and let's keep positive that things are gonna get better. And that's all for today. Uh, the conference came to an end. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.